US-India tensions are running at historically high levels. Recently, President Trump sat down with the Wall Street Journal and said that he believed that China may have encouraged the international spread of the virus to destabilize other competitor economies. To understand where we're going with this and what are the pressures on the United States vis-a-vis um, -vis China and vice versa, I have with me Michael Kugelman, who is the Deputy Director of the Asia Program at the Wilson Center in Washington, DC. Michael, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, my pleasure. Michael, tell me, what are the series of steps or missteps that have taken us to this point? Well, you know, just to step back for a moment, uh, there's always been a fair amount of um, tension in, in Washington in terms of those that think a hawkish position should be taken toward China and those that think a more conciliatory position should be taken. What we've seen with the Trump administration really from the day it took office, is a, a strong desire uh, to take a confrontational position. And I would highlight a key document that came out um, at the end of 2017, the Trump administration issued its first national security strategy. And that's, that document identified strategic rivalry as America's top national security challenge. And since China has long been America's top strategic rival, what the administration was saying is that it essentially regards India, pardon me, China, as not just a strategic rival, but as a top national security threat. So I think that is where the root of the tensions uh, can lie. But since then, as you know, you know, it's been one thing after the other. Uh, and certainly the pandemic, uh, unfortunately, has given President Trump a pretext to you know, blame China for something else. And I think that really hurt uh, in China. But do you think the reason why he's blaming China, because a lot of people say it's due to the fact that elections are happening uh, and he's pumping up his voter base. Is it that or is it the fact that it's part of the national strategy that China is now going to be acknowledged as the United States enemy? Well, it's both. I mean, it certainly is. It is a strategy that I think. I mean, the Trump administration views China as a, as a threat, as a strategic competitor, many things. But uh, yeah, the fact that you have an election is going to make the administration and Trump in particular double down because it plays well in the campaign trail. Because for Trump, I think that you know he gets a lot of political mileage out, not necessarily in depicting China as a security threat, but in depicting it as a country that threatens American jobs. And I think a lot of what he has said at home to domestic audiences about China focuses on this idea of China stealing American jobs. And I think that's a jobs is always a big political issue on the campaign trail. So I wouldn't be surprised if, if Joe Biden starts talking along those lines that, you know, we have to watch out for China because of the jobs that it uh, threatens. So it's really a perfect storm. Right? Well, how I mean, how realistic is of, that? You know, the, the, ch the job, uh, the value chain, because China is an essential part of your value chain. So realistically, it's not very realistic that you can, United States can do anything about it. No, I mean, I think this is unfortunately some of this uh, standard uh, native, nativist, anti, uh, you know, xenophobic, uh, anti-immigration type uh, rhetoric that we've heard so frequently from the Trump administration. No, I don't really think there's a big reason to believe that China is stealing or threatening American jobs. But again, it plays well. You know, we've had record unemployment levels here in the, or not record, we've had the worst unemployment levels since the Great Depression because of the pandemic. So again, that type of rhetoric really plays well at a time like this. In that sense, I mean, um, the India-China tensions that are happening, how are they working out in the United States? Um, is this another message that uh, the Trump administration is giving, that this is the big bad wolf China? I mean, we're not hearing too much from the United States with regard to the India-China tensions. Well, I would argue we're hearing more than we typically would. I mean, these okay. India-China spats, these border spats take place all the time. Typically, the U.S. government position is, is very, is, is nothing. It's, it's essentially silence. You know, typically, you have uh, the U.S. providing intelligence to India to help it uh, track Chinese positions in these types of spats. But what we've heard this time around are some very public remarks coming from senior U.S. leaders. Alice Wells, the top State Department official focused on South Asia right before she stepped down. She was very critical of what China was doing in Ladakh. Uh, and then we had a, a senior U.S. congressional leader, Elliot Engel, who heads the House International Relations Committee. He was very critical of China. Uh, so I would argue that things are a bit different this time around. And indeed, it is true that since that violent clash in, in Gawan uh, some days ago, the administration, including Trump, has been very quiet. I think that's because they want things to, to quiet down. But clearly, for the administration, I think this amplifies the importance of the U.S.-India relationship because it's a clear case, according to the U.S., of China engaging in provocative, threatening activities 
in the Indo-Pacific region, and particularly a provocation that affects India, a, a country that the U.S. views as a top partner in its effort to build out this Indo-Pacific strategy. How is the U.S. viewing the recent um, trilateral that happened between Russia, China, and India? Well, I mean, I, I imagine it can't be all that happy about it, uh, given that you know Russia is Russia is a rival um, for sure, and I think that it's a bit troubling, given that you know we know there's this controversy about this uh, this uh, missile defense deal, this S four hundred deal that uh, India and Russia have agreed to. The U S has threatened sanctions on India; hasn't actually done that yet. I don't think it will, but I think that at a moment when one might expect the U S and India to move even closer for the reasons I mentioned, especially with the, the China-India relationship really going downhill. Here you have this meeting in which you have senior Indian leaders meet with, with Russian leaders and the Chinese. Uh, so that's not going to go down well. I think it's a reminder that for all we talk of, about the U.S.-India relationship really growing, you know, India still has a fairly notable, a significant relationship with, with Russia. It's a, on a different trajectory than the U.S.-India relationship. But okay, so in terms of the quad, um, the, the RIC and the fact that G20 uh, meeting, there's a suggestion by China that we're going to, they should have a meeting on the sidelines. Do you think this threatens the Quad at all or maybe it delays the closeness of India going towards the Quad? Well, you know, I think that the Quad has more momentum now than it's had in quite a few years. I mean, there's been, uh, of course, ups and downs, but I think that, uh, you know, the countries involved, I mean, the U.S. certainly, along with India and, uh, and, and Japan and Australia, all pretty much see eye to eye. I mean, these are some of the, the top critics of, of China. They are the countries that are, I think, like-minded in the desire to, you know, push back against China. Of course, the Quad itself, is not publicly described as something that's meant to balance out Chinese power, but everyone knows that's what it's about, like the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy. So no, I to, to move forward, it actually comes a bit beyond all the aspirational talk and all that. How will it be operationalized? I think it's to be seen. So in, um, if we look at the U.S.-China part of this equation, do you think any improvement might be seen, or do we have to wait till after the election and maybe the State of Union address? Yeah, I, I don't think much is going to improve, especially in an election year. And as I said before, it's it's politically expedient for uh, American politicians to be critical of China, particularly looking at the at the jobs issue. Uh, I think it's it's troubling that the U.S. has sent uh, some air for, uh, aircraft carriers into the South China Sea. I don't think we should read too much into that, but I think it's really a, an effort to to intimidate. Um, but, you know, I think at this point in time, there's, bi there's a fair amount of bipartisan support in Washington for taking a pretty hard line on China. Okay. And so I imagine that whichever, uh, whoever wins the election in November, um, I think we're going to see some continuity in the U.S.-China relationship in the sense that it's going to continue to be bad. Um, but, you know, the, the truth of the matter is they actually do share a number of interests. They, the U.S. and China do see eye to eye on a number of things, such as, for example, you know, the issue of terrorism, counterterrorism worldwide. Um, you know, Afghanistan, there's a fair amount of convergence there. Both want the, uh, the, the, the war to end uh, and so on. Uh, China has been viewed by uh, U.S. officials as a key player in the North Korea crisis, given that China is one of the few countries that can, can work with the U.S. to mediate the dispute with North Korea. But I think that's been thrown to the wayside. So my bottom line is I think that, um, you know, we're looking at a very troubling trajectory for the U.S.-China relationship. It is there enough buyers? If you have a President Biden? Sorry, is there, is enough, there enough what? Is there enough sellers of the positive China-U.S. relationship? No, not right now. I mean, I, I would argue that, uh, you know, for many years, the one country that uh, would be, was, that was maligned more than any other was Iran. There's always so much hatred, like, like the rhetoric and the, 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 I, the images and perceptions of Iran was so strong here. But I think that China now is, is, is approaching that. There's just, everyone seems to be a hawk. It's hard to find, you know, any conciliatory voices on China, at least within the political mainstream here. And again, I think that's a bipartisan thing, not just a, not just a Republican Party thing. Where does that leave Pakistan then in that equation where Pakistan within the United States is increasingly seen as being siding with China. Um, what does that mean for U.S.-Pakistan relations? Well, I think it could be a constraint. Uh, you know, the U.S.-Pakistan relationship is in, is in a fairly good place now, uh, thanks to cooperation in Afghanistan. And, you know, after U.S. forces leave Afghanistan, that U.S.-Pakistan relationship will need another anchor, another basis for cooperation. 
But I think that so long as uh, Pakistan continues to be so close to China, and I imagine that partnership will strengthen even more given what's been happening with India and China, I think that could limit the ability of the U.S.-Pakistan relationship to go deeper than, than what it is now. It could be difficult to broaden it and make it into the, the strategic partnership that it's been at some times in past decades, especially during the Cold War, but not, but not really as much recently. So unfortunately, I think that, that you know, the, the China factor looms large, and I think that that could really be a, be a significant constraint on uh, building out the U.S.-Pakistan relationship in bigger ways. Michael, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. It's a pleasure.